hope you had a lovely weekend. I am thrilled to be here today on another episode of the Seamless Connection with Doug Vanderslice, EVP of Enterprise Services and System CFO at Boston Children's Hospital. Doug, pleasure to have you this morning. Thanks, Beta. Glad to be on. Thanks. Um, would love to hand it off to you to do a quick intro. I know you've been working in healthcare for many years now. You've worked all over the country, previously St. Louis, elsewhere. Um, and you've got a wealth of experience, not just in Boston, but just through different communities around the country, seeing the different um, needs and resources available throughout the country. Can you just give our audience a little taste of your background to, to show them kind of what you've seen over your years working in healthcare? Yeah, sure. So I've been uh, at Boston Children's for almost 11 years um, as a CFO, and more recently, over the past five or six years, my um, my responsibilities have expanded to include um, IT and uh, the, our, our digital um, uh, applications, as well as um, real estate strategy and uh, network development. Um, Prior to coming here, as you mentioned, I was at St. Louis Children's Hospital and BJC Healthcare, which is the parent of St. Louis Children's Hospital, for about nine years, and um, a different environment in that it was a large, you know, integrated health uh, system with multiple hospitals, and um, and so uh, a great learning experience for me. And then I started out my uh, my healthcare years at uh, Children's Health in Dallas, which is the Children's Hospital and Healthcare System uh, in Dallas, Texas. I actually started as um, uh, running a revenue cycle and, um, and then was a controller at Dallas Children's uh, for part of my time there. What's drawn you to work specifically at Children's Hospitals, which is a pretty unique and a very niche area, even within hospitals. Um, there are, you know, a, a tight knit network of them, as you well know, um, you know, Stanford is right down the street from us. Right. Um, and so I'm curious as, if there was anything specific in your background or your personal story that kind of drew you to children's hospital work in particular, or just that's just kind of how it happened to work out. It was actually just how it happened to work out. I, I, I began my career at Deloitte. Um, Deloitte Haskins and Sales way back in the day in Dallas. And uh, uh, one of the people I worked for at Deloitte um, had left and become uh, had become the CFO and the Chief Operating Officer at Dallas Children's. And uh, he actually drew me into uh, um, healthcare and the pediatric hospitals back in the early 90s. And so I had no real plan to get into pediatrics or specialized, so to speak, in pediatrics. But once I got in, you know, children's hospitals are wonderful places. Um, the, the missions are wonderful. They're similar at children's hospitals across the nation and the world, as you might imagine. Um, and people at children's hospitals, are, they just really buy into the mission. So they're pretty special places. And, you know, over the years, you kind of develop an expertise and I guess a reputation in this niche. And, um, and so you kind of follow the opportunities. And, um, and so for me, it's, you know, it's been a, a really uh, enjoyable career and, and um, having been able to be in this role at Boston Children's Hospital has been special. Boston Children's is a is a special place with a you know, great reputation. We have some of the most unbelievable clinicians and researchers uh, in the world. No, that's fantastic. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, there's very obvious differences between a, a typical hospital and a children's specialty hospital. Um, can you talk a little bit deeper from your kind of behind the scenes knowledge of something that we might not know as, as outside from the outside looking in of, you know, how different is it working in a children's hospital versus a typical hospital? Are there different operational, technological, um, you know, other issues that we should be aware of that are unique to the children's hospital setting that we might not um, understand? Yeah, I, th there are several several things that are different and unique. One I just mentioned, the cultures are, are, are really, um, they're really pretty special. I think the other thing is that children, generally speaking, are healthy. Um, and children that are sick are very, very sick. And so we tend to see you know, very high acuity. Um, our intensive care units tend to be um, quite large. There are, you know, there's a lot of uh, episodic type care, you know, ear tubes, um, tonsillectomies, um, you know, appendectomies, those sorts of things. But we see a lot of, um, particularly here at Boston Children's, a lot of kids that are very complex, uh, a lot of rare diseases. And so, and, and you know, kids aren't small adults, just small adults. They come in, you know, across the 
range of ages as well as sizes. So some other things I think that are a bit different in children's hospitals is there is a lot of um, special considerations given the age, the size, and the complexity of kids. So for instance, our pharmacies, they can't just take you know, prepackaged doses. We have to dose very specifically for the size and the age of the child. And that getting dosing correctly is extraordinarily important. It's something that's, you know, fraught with quite a bit of risk. Um, a, a lot of our kids are very complex with a lot of comorbidities. And so, you know, sometimes a relatively straightforward procedure like ear tubes or an appendectomy can be complicated if the kid has. Down syndrome or congenital heart disease. There's always different considerations. So I think in many respects, the things we do that can be more standardized in an adult setting oftentimes aren't quite as standardized because the kids come with a lot of complexities. Um, and then the final thing, this is probably more from a financial perspective than it is a care perspective, but uh, you know, we don't have Medicare as a significant Payer. There are a few kids that are covered by the Medicare program. Medicaid is our major government payer. And, um, you know, Medicaid is federally funded but state run and chronically underfunded, probably more so than Medicare. So we always have some challenges around, you know, just managing um, reimbursement in, in a place like ours where we're seeing kids from all 50 states managing a lot of different Medicaid programs. Those are some of the you know, I think things that make children's hospitals a bit different than adult hospitals. Well, and actually something you pointed out right there is a huge differentiator. Um, seeing kids from all 50 states, like you mentioned, most hospitals treat their community, right? Unless they're a major right. academic center, um, they're focused in their kind of dedicated catchment area. How do you think about serving an entire country, if you will? I know you're sharing it with other children's hospitals, but right. how do you, and especially through COVID, when you had to do a lot of that care virtually, how did that change your ability to reach your patients, whether that's bringing them in in person, which is I know what you would do for the most severe cases, or even helping yeah. them locally uh, from a virtual perspective? Yeah, so part of our serving all 50 states is that we provide care for a lot of rare cases and complex cases. And so, um, you know, we're not we, we work closely and we know well our colleagues at other children's hospitals across the country. We're not, you know, we're not trying to um, replicate the type of care they can provide here in Boston. So almost by definition, particularly those that come from outside of the New England area, they have some sort of a complicated condition that we have a specific expertise in. And so, you know, during the pandemic, we did a lot more virtual care. Um, at least for the initial consult for those types of patients. But many of them, you know, sometimes it's a second opinion or it's a, um, helping to find a diagnosis and we find the treatment can occur at home. But ultimately, many of those kids need to come here for some sort of a procedure or a you know, therapeutic regimen. So it, it was slowed down during the pandemic when it was hard to travel. Um, and, uh, you, you know, we were... Um, had to slow down on, on several occasions, um, you know, non-urgent, non-emergent care. Um, but at, at the end of the day, most of the kids from uh, particularly outside of the New England area, and we see, you know, we see uh, kids that come in from all over the world for, you know, specialized care here at Boston Children's Hospital. And most frequently, it does require the family to come into Boston because there's a, you know, direct procedure or some sort of therapeutic that we have to administer to the child in person. No, that makes sense. And since COVID has ended and since the emergency has ended, um, how much of kind of what you do at Boston Children's today is done virtually versus in person? I understand what you're saying in terms of right. you, know, you have to come in for a certain amount of it, but even with that, has virtual care become a bigger portion of delivering care than it was before the pandemic? Or has it been uh, Yes. Yeah, absolutely. We, um, you know, like everybody before the pandemic, we were probably doing 10 to 15 cases a week virtually. Uh, we scaled up to, you know, we, we see, you know, we probably have about 750, 800,000 patient visits per year. And, uh, you know, we were seeing 90% of those virtually during the height of the pandemic. And for ambulatory visits, that still remains between 18 and 20% of our, our total visit 
um, volume. So we have uh, settled in at much higher than pre-pandemic, um, you know, virtual cases. And for us, I think a couple of things at play. We had invested pretty heavily in um, virtual care prior to the pandemic. And so uh, our scale up, everybody had to scale up quickly. I think the quality of our scale up was relatively high and the physicians were pleased with how well, and the patients were pleased with how well we were able to facilitate virtual visits. Um, and, you know, for kids particularly, if you can do a visit virtually, um, it's, it's great for everybody. You, you minimize the amount of time that the kid's out of school. Um, traffic's terrible in Boston. And so if the parent can, you know, um, not have to drive from work uh, to pick their kid up at school, drive all the way into Boston, park, just navigating our facility is, is complicated. Um, we, we can save a lot of time by doing the visit virtually. So the parents really, uh, you know, they really like it. So that's, that's kept our level of virtual visits relatively high uh, post pandemic. Now there, you know, there, there's always this tension and it's, um, you know, important to differentiate what types of cases should be done virtually and in what situations does the physician need to actually see the child, touch the child, um, you know, so there's, there are quality you know, there are quality implications there, obviously, and, and considerations, I guess I should say. I was going to say, do you have algorithms in place that kind of automate that process of decision making process of this child is appropriate, this child is maybe not so appropriate for virtual care? We don't have algorithms in place. We do have policies and, um, and you know, it's a very specialty by specialty type um, decision. So, the you know, the, the judgment of the specialist obviously comes into play. Um, and we have, you know, within various specialties, there are um, policies in place as to what's appropriate to be done virtually, and what should be done in person. Patient preference also, you know, is uh, is a factor in this. Um, if a patient wants to, and it's appropriate for the care to be provided virtually, we'll, we'll do it virtually. If they want to come in and be seen by the physician, we'll accommodate their preference in that respect as well. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, I know one of the newest projects, um, and I guess the one of the most important projects you're working on now is the EPIC implementation and the transition right. for Boston Children's. Um, as EVP uh, for Enterprise Systems, how did you think about that decision? And what, what were the kind of key factors that went into it? Because I know for you, it's not just this EMR versus another EMR, it's how do we maximize what we can get out of each one with your goal in terms of automating, streamlining, getting more operational efficiencies from each and every single piece of software and application that you have, right? Yeah, so for us, we had a, um, previously we were uh, Epic Revenue Cycle and Cerner Clinicals, but not a very clean Cerner Clinicals. We had a lot of customization. We had a lot of our own custom built applications and we had a lot of third party bolt on applications. So. Internally, I think we had a very high degree of dissatisfaction with our systems because the integration wasn't very tight. Um, you know, clinicians oftentimes would have to log into multiple systems to be able to see all the patient information. Um, the integration from particularly both, both customized, you know, Cerner applications and third party and homegrown applications, the integration into a core system was just, it was complicated, it was messy. And so while there were a lot of customizations that made the care in the moment easier, kind of the totality of our systems environment was really clunky and complicated for people to operate within. And we spent you know, a lot of time looking at the various system options, looking at are there ways we can more elegantly um, integrate together our complicated system environment. And the conclusion we came to was no, that we really would be much better off if we had a single, seam, seamlessly, as seamless as possible, integrated system. We also found that, you know, not only is it easier for clinicians and for our revenue cycle people to operate in this type of environment, but we, um, it was quite expensive to maintain multiple systems. It was hard to do upgrades because with customizations, you have to, um, you know, you have to kind of 
reintegrate in the new version your customized software. So we found that there was operating efficiencies to having a single um, seamless system. So it's a large investment, but we think actually that there there is a return um, financially, even though that wasn't our primary driver, um, because we'll be able to operate in a cleaner, simpler environment. So those are the the types of things that we thought about. And so it's definitely it. like in terms of trying to streamline all the different point solutions you were using, trying to streamline kind of the different logins. We know we hear that from our doctors all the time in terms of the number of logins is is kind right. of the biggest pain point, right? Um, how do you think about that looking forward when we have so much innovation these days? We've got chat GPT, we've got generative AI, we've got all sorts of things we probably don't even know about yet. Um, how do you hope to see systems flex? I'm talking about software systems, you know, computers right. flex to accommodate that in the future. Cause it's, it's, while it's hoped for, it's unlikely that an Epic or a Cerner or whoever, you know, whichever integrated system people are using will have everything, right? They just don't work big enough as, as a big company. You're going to have to, um, have, have add-ons or have, uh, capabilities that maybe aren't in the big players quite as yet when you need them. How do you think about that? Yeah, so I think, you know, one thing we we do, we want to use our delivered applications as fully as possible. And, and you know, I think a lot of software vendors, um, they, they listen to their customers. They can't listen and react to every customer. But I think being an active part of that um, development process with our vendors is a really important thing. And, and, and we want to be, you know, we want to be a, an active part of that development process. Process. And, um, you know, I think in selecting a vendor, it's important to go with one that is putting a lot of resources into developing in their applications technology as it evolves. Um, we recognize that our core systems won't be able to do everything. And so, you know, there, there's always uh, there's always this this trade off and you, and you hope you don't have to compromise in these trade offs, but these trade offs between um, when do you plug into an existing application some functionality that might make the operating environment a little more complicated, but 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 that additional functionality is so important that it's worth complicating that environment versus you know waiting for your vendor to integrate that into their um, existing applications. So it you know it it takes judgment and it takes a lot of internal communications around what are we willing to you know actually try to build something into uh, and, and compromise a little bit of our uh, uh, you know, core system environment to get functionality that we want. I think everybody recognized that we would be able to do less of that type of, uh, of customization or plugging in if we went with Epic. And to some degree, there was a recognition that, yeah, we're not going to be able to tailor things to our liking quite as much as we have in the past. Um, but We'll, we'll make, you know, we'll make careful decisions as to what, you know, what we bring in from the outside versus, you know, waiting for, um, for our vendor to uh, enhance their capabilities. My, my impression thus far is that, you know, Epic in particular is putting a lot of resources, particularly in the generative AI. So we're hopeful that they will create a lot of solutions that work. Um, that work very well for us. I will say we have a, a you know, we have a very active um, digital accelerator that is um, working with outside vendors to create, you know, um, technology enhancements. And um, uh, uh, so innovation is extraordinarily important. It's been a core value at Boston Children's for a long time. So, you know, we, we are, we're learning how to manage in this new environment. And, um, you know, ho hopefully we will, as we move into the future, be able to keep our systems and our capabilities as contemporary as possible, provide functionality for our physicians and clinicians who are always trying to push, you know, kind of push the edge on what we're capable of doing. Um, but I, I don't know. That's, yeah. uh, that's the way I think about it. I'm not yeah, sure no, how part of an answer it is, but that's the way I think about it. <laughs> There's always those, those nuances that you never know until you're in the moment, right? Um, yeah. when you're listening to your team and who do you think about, uh, when you're kind of looking for the voices that say, this is what we need to do this, you know, this is what I'm, these are the inputs that I'm taking into account for these kinds of decisions. Cause it's rare to get to, to, to kind of pick the brain of an operational leader. Usually I'm talking to clinical leaders from, but from the operation side, like 
Do you listen to the clinical team, the CMO, the doctors? Is there, are you looking for, you know, kind of the feedback from your IT team and their evaluation of different kind of needs and where the industry is going or where the hospital is going, where your needs are going? How do you take into account the different voices you hear internally in terms of, hey, these are the features and functionality that we need to develop or we need to have? You mentioned generative AI, right? Like, is that something that's being pushed from your clinician, you know, your clinical team side or from your tech team side or something you just have decided that, hey, this is where the industry is going. We need to be ready for this. Yeah, I mean, look, we want we want our IT teams to be as closely integrated into our clinical operations as possible. So at the end of the day, you, you those that are working on the front lines um, of healthcare understand um, that they understand how patient care is delivered. And many of them are stepping back and thinking through, okay, how can we do this better? And um, I think there's a little bit of a, a, a nice, you know, uh, two-way two -way communication that needs to occur in that our technical people sometimes understand better what's possible. And, um, and um, uh, you, you want them communicating what's possible within our systems with the clinical people. And at the same time, they need to be listening to the clinical people and understanding where the pain points are and how we can solve those pain points with technology. So, you know, my place in the organization, I, I'm not making a lot of the decisions as to, you know, who we listen to, what we listen to, what we're gonna build in and what we're not going to build in. You really want that to happen as close to the front lines of care delivery as possible, because that's those are the people that really understand, um, you know, what, what we need to improve upon, how we can make the patient experience and the, you know, the clinical experience better. So, yeah, and that said, I, I will say we do go through formal exercises of um, sending out calls for pain points, and uh, our our digital accelerator does that on a fairly regular basis. And right now, they're they're they are doing that with a particular eye towards generative AI. So, what what are pain points that you experience out there um, in the clinical world and in the administrative world? And um, let's let's uh, let's find those major pain points and understand how can AI um, and other digital technologies help solve those pain points. So we do have formal mechanisms for getting out of the organization and trying to, you know, pull out what were our opportunities, what where, where are those lie. That's fantastic. What are you hearing, uh, kind of the early take on that kind of uh, that survey, if you will, in terms of the pain points that generative AI could potentially help solve operationally or clinically? So it's funny because there's a give and take there. There are we have some of our very innovative people that are just, you know, rushing out to do as much as they can with generative AI. So we've had to be very careful to set up very specific environments that they can work with them that are HIPAA compliant and, um, you know, safe and protected, but also have the large language models built in. So um, so they can, you know, they can play it. And there's all types of, you know, things from, you know, how do you, um, um, how do you, uh, um, you know, improve the diagnostic and, and kind of streamline the diagnostic process? To you know, what are what are the uh, appropriate best appropriate ways to you know intake a patient that has you know a complicated set of uh, um, uh, symptoms that um, you know you might not easily be able to uh, put a diagnosis to. Um, but there's also a, a bit of uh, of a uh, kind of a, a pull as well in that, you know, probably more in administrative areas, but in a lot of the clinical areas as well, people are so busy doing their jobs in the current environment every day that, you know, we want to make sure they understand what's possible with technology. So, you know, there, uh, some of the automation we've already done, and this is kind of on the edge of AI versus um, you know, less sexy technology, but we've been able to use um, robotic process automation to improve revenue cycle functions and uh, make them less manually intensive, particularly around getting authorizations and um, um, uh, referrals uh, documented. We've been able to do a lot with HR um, in terms of um, verifying certifications for nurses and physicians. I think that there's a lot of opportunity for, particularly for complex cases, <clears throat> the getting appropriate authorizations is requires pulling together 
a lot of pieces of information from the medical record. And, um, you know, I think we, we have the opportunity to use generative AI to predict um, and to go out and find the pieces of information um, um, in an automated way to really streamline the process of getting <clears throat> authorizations or justifying, you know, payment for services. So we find that, you know, the, the, the opportunities that people talk about kind of go up all the way across from diagnostics to treatment options to some of the more mundane type administrative tasks that, <clears throat> that take a lot of people's time um, that hopefully can free people up to, you know, either get their work done or do more value added activities. No, that completely makes sense. What is the most interesting or off the wall request you've heard, whether it's from generative AI or, or something else? Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's a, and I, I will tell you, I'm not getting these requests directly. So um, I, I would probably have to ask one of my team members, you know, what's the, what's the, what's the most off the wall. But, but I will say there's, you know, you, you talk to those in our organization that are leading this work. And it is a, it's a real dichotomy between those that you have to rein in versus those that you want to help, you know, open their eyes to what's possible out there. Right. No, that makes sense. Um, if you're looking at the system kind of five years out in the future, and I don't know how long you think it'll take to play out, but um, assuming in five years we're, we've kind of figured out an appropriate way to use generative AI, HIPAA compliant, all of that nicely um, guardrailed, what is your hope and expectation for the potential of generative AI in healthcare? Yeah, and I will tell you one of the most, <clears throat> I think one of the biggest issues that needs to be resolved with generative AI is just the, the, the trust and credibility in the results, you know, particularly when it comes to, um, you know, particularly when it comes to uh, looking at large, you know, it's obviously always looking at large amounts of data, but there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of false positives out there, right? That referring to research that actually has not yet occurred. So, you know, I, I think one place you want it to get is that it, that generative AI is, you know, you're confident that it's providing credible information, right? It's not making stuff up. Um, but then, you know, I, I, I guess I look at it, I, I, because of my background and my role, I can kind of conceive of what's possible in some of the more um, operational financial type um, areas. And I, I think I find that, you know, our, operating leaders and administrative leaders, there's just never enough time to get done everything that you need to get done. You can either spend your days managing your email and responding quickly to email or, or spend your days, you know, just getting by on that and really thinking about and working on um, developing, you know, what, uh, where we're going in the future. <clears throat> I think one area that um, for, uh, for a lot of leaders, it, I think, Generative AI will allow us to work so much more efficiently and allow us to get done the things that we need to get done and spend sufficient amounts of time understanding how to optimize our systems and um, how to, you know, um, how to best run our organizations. Uh, people spend a lot of time putting together presentation decks, but we should be able to automate presentation decks um, and spend less time. Uh, on presentation decks. We have a lot of people that are generating and evaluating quality information. They're generating and evaluating financial information. Um, and even though we have pretty good data warehouses and pretty good tools to access information, I think there's a lot in just analyzing, framing, and then putting in a, communi you know, a, a, a good communication form it's a very manually intensive processes. I think generative AI has the potential to get really good drafts and then allow us, one, to have better distilled information to make decisions from and spend less time um, on actually framing up and more time, you know, adding value to the discussions. Th those are, I don't know, there's a few of the things I see in my world that uh, we can get done with generative AI. Then when you get into the, you know, to the clinical world and the research world um, and, you know, better ability to deal with just enormous types of data. Um, 
and, and I don't want to get too far over my skis with science because I'm not a scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but just um, <clears throat> the, I know we have uh, a lot of expertise in um, analyzing and understanding the human genome and, you know, trying to make genetic associations with specific disease states. Um, it's a really hard thing to do. It's almost a needle in a haystack type proposition. You have to believe that generative AI can speed those processes up and, you know, get to medical solutions in a uh, much more precise way quicker than we have been able to in the past. Oh, no, that completely makes sense. Um, and then as we kind of wrap up here, do you, how much of what you look at, again, from a Boston Children's perspective in your role here, do you think is universal across hospitals and health systems in the country today in terms of the challenges and the opportunities you're facing from a systems perspective, from an enterprise perspective, uh, versus maybe potentially unique to Boston Children's? Because I'm curious to see how much of, of the lessons that you've, you've learned that you've, you've talked to us about today could potentially translate uh, more broadly? Yeah, I mean, I think look, there's a lot of workflow issues and um, um, uh, I, I, I don't know if I could put a percentage to it. I, I would say 75% of the things that we're trying to do are pretty broadly applicable and probably more than that in pediatric environments. There are some nuances um, be, because we have our own nuanced culture and sets of operations and, uh, and uh, you know, complex patient types that us and only a handful of hospitals, other children's hospitals take care of. So, you know, there, there, are, there, there, are some, there are some things that are very specific and unique to the way we do things, but I don't know. I think that um, as we're figuring out what to do with uh, generative AI. Um, I think there are broad applications across healthcare systems. And I think we have to be very open to what other industries, you know, how they're harvesting the technology, because there's a lot that occurs in other industries, particularly in the financial and administrative side and operational side that, you know, we need to learn from Pr prior to AI becoming such a big, you know, opportunity set. I think we've had a lot to learn from from other industries, broadly applicable, um, and I think more so now in this uh, uh, in the future environment. No, that makes sense. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me this morning. It was lovely to pick your brain and kind of see, you know, what has brought you guys to where you are today and what you're looking for for the future. So I'm excited to see. Maybe in a year we'll we'll recircle back and, and look at how this implementation is going and where AI is taking you guys. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah.